Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that exhortation. On the count of three, let's just all say amen, shall we? One, two, three. Amen. Thank you for the word of the Lord today. It's a very powerful psalm. It really, really is. And so... uh we do want you to be encouraged this morning as Tom has shared with us. God is at work in our world and Christmas and the message of Christmas is a beautiful example of that. And I've been talking to you a little bit about uh, Christmas, especially from Jesus' side of it. And I've been talking to you about renewing your mind. And because uh, we need our minds renewed. Our minds, uh, sometimes we, uh, we struggle w- maintaining joy. We struggle to see a clear perspective. We struggle to remember Psalm 77, I believe that Tom just read. We struggle to remember those words of encouragement and affirmation, assurance. And sometimes when we gather together, uh, hopefully every time that we gather together, uh, we can have our mind renewed and uh, refocused. And we can have things uh, presented to us, uh, examples held up before us uh, that will help us realign, refocus, and uh, direct our thinking in a right way. And so this series is about renewing our mind. It's about renewing our relationships. Uh, it's, it's about Paul, the apostle, writing to a group of young baby believers in a city called Philippi. And it's about facing some issues and problems that they had. And that Paul, who was in prison in Rome, he receives a message uh, a message from a special messenger from the Philippian congregation uh, by the name of Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus updates Paul on the various uh, things that are happening in the church locally in Philippi. And Paul is so moved by the many different, while it was a, a commendable congregation, he is so moved by the number of issues that they have circulating in their relationships and within the body and the church there. And so, how, in his absence, could he address these particular needs? How could he bring unity again to a a body that was beginning to divide? Um, How could he bring hope again? How, How could he convey what example could he hold up 
before them that would motivate them, even though he's not present with them, he's absent from them and cannot get to them, how can he uh, motivate them to change their thinking and to unify around a common cause? How can he, how can he bring them to a place uh, here in their spiritual journey and their growth where they can find, somehow grab hold of joy uh, despite what's happening in their circumstances? And so what he does, and I've shared with you in previous messages, uh, what he does is he holds up the incarnational example of Jesus before a divided Philippian community. And he says, you know what? In so many ways, I cannot possibly solve every problem in everyone's individual life, especially I'm here in Rome, I'm incarcerated, I'm restricted. I can't possibly solve every situation that Epaphroditus, your messenger, who came with a gift to support Paul in this time, I cannot possibly address all of these things, but I want to give you a one-stop solution to the issues that you face in your life. A one example solution. Now, he goes on to give some other examples here. And we see this, I think slide, uh, is it slide six or seven where he he shows the examples. Uh, Of course, he gives us the example of Jesus and Paul himself. He he, uh, illustrates what he's asking them to do. And Timothy, Epaphroditus, these are great examples. And and it's something good for us to think about, you know, what kind of example am I? Uh, And if people follow my example as I process through life, Will, will they be in a good place, uh, having followed my example and my lead? And so we are all examples. We all have influence. And, and Paul utilizes these individuals, including himself, to ha- set before the people examples for how to think about things. And we've, most recently, we've worked through uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, uh, which includes one of the most uh, powerful Christmas passages Uh, that really we could read in the Bible. Uh, If we could somehow get into the mind of Jesus, we would see that uh, Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mind set as Christ Jesus. And what kind of mindset did he have? Uh, What kind of mindset do we need to have? Um, What kind of mindset is is a mindset that will help us solve most of the issues and problems that we face in our life. How can we get through it? Well, uh, just by way of review, Jesus was being in the very na- who was in the very nature of God, and being in the very nature of God, he says, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Uh, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He, he uh, humbled himself, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue uh, acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And because he lives, you and I live also. And so he's currently reigning and, and he's ruling and And he will visibly do this in days yet to come. But Paul, having reminded the people who are plagued by issues and problems, relationally and otherwise, he reminds them of the incarnation. He puts Jesus before them. And having reminded them of this great incarnational truth, he does something very unique. And he says in verse 12 on the screen, he says, Therefore... In conclusion, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. And so Paul transitions now from this great incarnational passage and this great incarnational example of Jesus And he transitions from this exhortation to an exhortation for them to take on the mind of Christ. And he says, even though I'm not there, I know a letter doesn't carry as much weight 
as my personal presence carries. But the Philippians, uh, nevertheless, they need exhorted, they need encouraged, they need commended, and he does, certainly does this in his letter. But he, Paul transitions now and he says, you know, I know there's maybe a tendency for you to do what I'm asking you to do. If I was there in, pre- in person, I was there present and you could see me and you could hear this, these words coming from my own lips. And maybe uh, there would be some value uh, to my being there and perhaps I could address all of your individual problems and conflicts. Well, he specifically even states uh, and, and addresses Yodi and Sintashi a little later in the text and the letter. So he does get specific with them. But there's more problems than just those uh, problems between those two ladies here in the letter. There's many problems. And so Paul seems to be saying that I want you, even though I'm not there, and even though there's a tendency uh, not to be as energetic to do what someone is asking you to do if they're not there present with you when they ask you to do it, even though this is coming in letter form, he's saying, I want you with the same energy as if I were standing right in front of you, and I point blank ask you, would you please have the mindset of Christ as you face this issue? And he wants them to do this even though he's absent from them. And so this is like the second time he talks about his absence. And and I think the Philippians have issues just like us. We tend not to be as energetic when we're not being watched, when we're not being observed, when we're not being, you know, under the watchful eye of maybe another. Uh, We tend to slack off a little. And so Paul is like, you know, I want, even though I'm not there, Christ sees, he sees and he knows the mindset by which you're, you're living your life. And so he says, uh, you know, uh, do not work out your salvation as though impelled to action by my presence merely. No, he says, work out solutions to your daily problems. I can't possibly address them all, but here's an example. And once you see this example, the incarnational example of Jesus, you will have solutions to your own problems and I will not even have to have been there to fix it. Will you just apply this model, he says, to every issue in your life? Live this way. Renew your mind in this way, you see. And so Paul seems to be saying that even though I'm not with you, and I cannot possibly know all the daily challenges that you face in your relationships and your health and otherwise, he seems to be saying that even though I'm not there to give you personal guidance on every issue, he seems to be saying that the distance between you and me prohibits me from being there, even though I want to be there so desperately. I cannot be there. I can't be there to coach you through every little decision that you have to make. It's just impossible. Time and space and distance and mileage will not permit it. But he says, he says, if you will develop the incarnational demeanor of Jesus, and you will apply that to every issue or problem or situation you face, even though I'm not absent, you will find yourself doing the right thing 99% of the time. And I will not even have to hold your hand to get through that, he says. The relational issues. Okay? So you won't need me there, he says. Because you're going to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, If they will do this, they will find solutions to the problems that they face. You know, I think that probably Epaphroditus had shared with Paul so many things. And he's like, you know what? If I address all these specific issues, this letter is going to be not four chapters. It's going to be about 14. And I know you're, you're wanting to get back to them. I know they're anxious to hear word if I've been executed or not. So Epaphroditus... I'm going to give you this example. And you just emphasize to the people, everyone, live this way. Walk in this new mindset. And the grumbling and the bickering and the arguing and the nitpicking. And he's going to address this a little later in a few verses. Uh, And so we'll be looking at this in coming days. But he's like, I'm going to offer a one-stop, succinct conclusion and solution to everyone's problems. And this is it. The mindset of Jesus. And I want to ask you a question. Uh, What real life problem do you need to apply the mindset of Jesus? The Philippians 2, 5-11 mindset of Jesus to today. And this is the pastor in me. 
that's coming out. And as I think about the different scenarios and situations um, that we find ourselves in, I just have this series of questions. As I think about uh, the various issues that pop up in any group of believers, not just the Philippian believers, but any group of believers. And so I would just ask, you know, are you having relational problems that maybe stem from the careless thoughts of others? Maybe there's a deep sense of being offended over something that maybe someone has done. Maybe over the holidays or or maybe in the past and the holidays just kind of surface it in a new way. Could I just encourage you in light of the mindset of Christ? Could I just encourage you to forgive? Could I? Uh, Not because people deserve it, but because that's what Jesus did on a cross. And the Philippians 2, 5 through 11 passage talks about it. He absorbed the hurt. He embraced the pain. He chose to conquer it with love. And it's only the deepest love that bears the pain caused by another. And only the deepest love that can say, I'll die, I'll, I'll, I will die to what I want and put Christ first. Philippians 2, 8 says, you know, the mindset of Christ's passage. It says, death on a cross. And so if you're having problems relationally, I want you to remember what Jesus did. And I want you to apply that to your current relational problem. And I want you to see that it was sometimes when we forgive, it feels like a crucifixion. It feels like we're dying to everything that's important to us in our life. But Jesus, the text says, the great Christological hymn says in Philippians 2.8, He submitted Himself to becoming a man. Not just any man, but a servant. Not just any servant, but an executed man. Not just any executed man, a cross-executed man. He humbled Himself. He just got lower and lower and lower and lower. And maybe that's what needs to happen in a relationship in your life. You see, Paul offers a one-stop solution to every problem that they were facing. And perhaps it's a relational one. I'm sure it was relational here in in the letter to the Philippians. Here's another kind of a pastoral question. Are you weary with some heavy, some heavy burden you have to carry? Maybe it's a health ailment. Maybe it's a financial hardship. Maybe there's a social stigma of some sort that you've wrestled with. And maybe you're frustrated by the limitations of your body and mind. And if you can only think more clearly. And if you only do more. And if you can only uh, overcome some of these stigmas and things that you've kind of had in your life. And, And could I persuade you though, in light of this mind of Christ passage. Could I persuade you with the words and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He accepted the limitations of his humanity. And he embraces life, though in a severely restricted form, compared to the life he formerly knew before the incarnation. Could I, could, I, could I encourage you with the mindset of Christ to embrace your limitations and even perhaps even allow the body of Christ uh, to come around you and to strengthen you and to be Christ to you? And another question that pops into my head, not just are you having relational problems or are you weary with some heavy uh, health ailment or heavy burden or hardship or stigma or or you're just feeling the limitations of of your humanity. Perhaps another question, do you have to live in the shadow or have you had to live in the shadow of some, uh, someone else's accomplishments? And maybe that's just underscored in a new fresh way this time of year. And maybe you you watch others, maybe in your family, maybe in your network of friendships, and you struggle. They seem to be on the way up, and you seem to be on the way down, and you're not quite sure what's happening and why life tends to go that way. Could I encourage you with those wonderful incarnational words, He made Himself nothing. I don't understand the ups. I don't understand the downs. But if I'm nothing, that's fine. Jesus was nothing. He made himself nothing. And if I'm nothing, that's okay. Just give me Jesus. Just let me know he's there. I'll be nothing. I'll have no prestige. I'll have no, I'll have no uh, 
uh, a position to which I'll cling. Rather, I'll be nothing. Just give me him. You see, Paul says this incarnational demeanor, it will solve every problem that you have. Every problem. He says, and again, the pastoral uh, thought here, you know, I'm thinking of the questions. Are you tired of serving some who may very well, or, or, or who may have very little appreciation for your work? Maybe you're in that kind of a, of a situation. Maybe some of you have cooked great meals and, and, and maybe you took time at the holiday to make a great meal. And then when someone said, in Jesus' name, amen, like five minutes later, the meal was just destroyed. I mean, it was consumed. And about two seconds after that, they kicked out from the table and they're off doing other things. And you had this great vision of a mealtime with your family, taking time to talk and getting to know each other. And it's like, it's like no one really appreciated that. You know, and, I, and I'm convinced, especially this time of year, you know, some people think that refrigerators magically get filled. And some people think that floors and bathrooms magically get cleaned. And some people think that bills magically get paid and cars magically get, magically get maintained. And, and we don't stop to think about these things and, and even say thank you sometimes. And you may be tired of the tedious and the menial task, but, but could I remind all of you maybe who have had a, a similar experience to that, taking the very nature of a servant. Philippians 2.7 he took the very nature of a servant. It's the Son of God washing dirty, stinky feet. Wow. And so there's something of the incarnational demeanor of Jesus in our lives when we walk through these things. You see, are you with me this morning? Are you having relational problems? One-stop solution. Are you weary with some heavy burden? One-stop solution. Do you have to live in the shadow of accomplishment? One-stop solution. Are you tired of serving some who may have very little appreciation for your service? One-stop solution. Are you surrounded maybe by people in your world, maybe you work with a few, who feel like they should be added to the Trinity? You know, God the Father, Son, and Spirit, and Bill, you know or John, or Sue, or, or uh, Christina, whoever, right? You work with them. And it's like, you know, if I know when Jesus, he didn't drop out of the Trinity, but when he came to earth for a little while, I know I work with somebody who would have been more than glad to volunteer to take his place in, in the throne on high. Because that's pretty much what I get every day, right? And, and, and maybe you're with people like that and, and, and maybe you like to return the rude favors the rude things that they have done in your life just to instigate issues and create problems but could I take you to Philippians 2 6 this morning C could I take you to that wonderful phrase he did not take advantage C could I remind you that he had every right to hang on to his position. He had every right to let us humans know what a great inconvenience that we created for him, what a great dilemma we created for him. He had every right to come with an attitude that said, how could you people be so rude to pull me out of heaven to bring me into this mass for 30 some odd years only to nail me to a cross? Now, if you had to do that and I had to do that, we'd let somebody know about it. But not Christ. He didn't take advantage. You know, you know how it is. Somebody pulls out in front of you. It's little things. They pull out in front of you. You're going about 55, 65. You're on the brakes. <laughs> Groceries are flying. Kids are flying. Dogs are flying. Okay. And then they go 25 feet and put the right signal on and get on there. Oh, okay, great. Now, that's just going to make my holiday really special, right? Come on now. See, this is stuff where we live. Paul says, I don't have time to personally coach you through every issue you've got in Philippi. But I'll give you a one-stop solution. And his name is Jesus. If you'll do what he did, I won't have to be there. 
in my absence or in my presence, you will keep growing as Christ followers and things will get better in your life because you have now got in this wonderful journey of renewing the mind, of rethinking everything in light of what Christ has already done in you. So Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You can only work out what God has already worked in. So, and if we look a little later, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So God is in you. And so now we are to work out. We are to find solutions to our own problems by adopting the incarnational demeanor of Jesus and work that out through the energy that God gives so that we can be agents of joy, of hope, of strength, of peace. Now, something intriguing here, and it's confused, I think, a lot of people. It says to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And when we see the word salvation, it literally means to be rescued from a peril or from some danger. The very word salvation signifies that we cannot save ourselves. And it means to be taken out uh, from under a menacing influence of some kind. And so the, the word salvation refers to everything that God does for us. And it comes in three tenses in the Bible. Now I want to make this observation clarification because... Some want to read into this that we work for salvation. And that's not what Paul is saying at all. We don't work for salvation. We work out salvation, that which God has worked in, we work out, but we're not working for. And so uh, salvation comes to us in three tenses in the Bible. There's a past tense of salvation usage, there's a present tense, and there's a future tense. Uh, So there's a sense in which we have been saved. There's a sense in which we are being saved. And there's a sense in which we aren't saved yet, but will be. And so these are the three tenses of salvation. Paul used all three tenses. Uh, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are, we have been saved. There's no condemnation. It's done. The world has been delivered. We have been saved. We have been rescued. There's a present tense, like Paul says here. Work out now and you'll be spared many sinful consequences. If you guys in Philippi and all of us believers will adopt the demeanor of Jesus as solution as a one-stop solution to all of our issues it's going to spare us a lot of sinful consequences and so he's saying you are being saved now work out your salvation in the present tense live it out in your life and then there's a future tense we will be saved first Thessalonians 1:10 Christ rescues us from the coming wrath okay so you will be saved and so i i recognize this morning that there's just great uh, uh things that i could say about each of these tenses of salvation but in the interest of time and and, and to zero in even more uh, uh, d- detailed into our passage here i think i'll just look at this present tense salvation that is you are being saved presently and how are you being saved Well, there are many things that you're being saved from because you are a Christ follower. There's addictions. Think about how addicted you would be if you weren't a Christ follower. Think about how you would, your your proclivities to do certain things when life gets hard, when holidays bring uh, bad news and things. You tend to lean into your addiction, but when you're a Christ follower, you have found a better way to cope. And not just cope, a better way to find joy and strength and hope and healing. Just think about how addicted you would be without the body of Christ. How you, would, you, would, uh, you wouldn't be working out your salvation, rather you would be uh, uh, deepening the pit in which you're, you're, you're choosing to live, you see. Think about the relational turmoil you're going to be uh, spared from by living out the incarnational demeanor of Jesus. Think about a broken body 
that no doubt would be ours if we just leaned into our addictions uh, without control. You see, the Bible says that we're polluted. We need saved. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never heard about the three tenses of salvation. But you have been saved. There's a very real sense to which I can say to you this morning, you've been saved. You've been delivered. God has come into the world in Christ. It has been rescued. God, this unblinking cosmic stare, he smiled on all the world at Christmas. And he says, here you go. Here's the gift. Watch him live. Watch him die. Watch him as he is raised and appearing. Watch for him to once again come back. But here, here is the gift. You have been saved. You are saved. You've been rescued. The peril has been averted. Danger has been silenced step the precipice we are now away from the precipice christ is the bridge and now we have hope you have been saved past tense the question is are you being saved are you are you leaning into your old sinful patterns of the past or are you choosing to work out your salvation are you choosing to live in a new family with a new lord a new savior a new mindset a new joy are you being saved and then i bet this morning everybody here if i ask for hands i bet everybody here would say you know what i want to be saved because someday the final curtain is going to drop on this world and this thing's going to go kaput and one age is going to be swallowed by another and pastor i want to be saved i need to be saved I need to be, I need to avert the coming, uh, the coming disaster that the Bible talks about. And you're like, yes, that's me. So everybody here this morning, we're going this together, guys. You have been saved, everyone. You are being saved, partnering with Christ. That's the given, that's the assumption that you're partnering with Christ, working out your salvation. If you're not there in the present tense, I'm going to give you a present tense moment when we wrap it up today. Okay, you've seen those shirts that say, got saved. All right, got saved. I think we know what people mean. But there's a sense in which we all have been saved. But there's a sense in which we can resist our salvation. And we can resist and we can lean into our addictions and we can find ourselves wrapped up in a life of just turmoil and chaos and, and bondage. And then we all need to be saved. There's a coming day. Paul talks about this later Uh, in the chapter in our passage and we're only going to probably make it to verse 12 today Uh, but uh, he he talks about the coming day of the Lord and how he wants to be faithful and be ready for that day but you need to be saved you need salvation that's why we meet every week that's why we're here that's I I realize I may be talking to some who have no church background and, and when we talk about salvation that's what we're talking about We need rescued. And we can't get rescued until we admit we're lost. Until we admit I I need found. I didn't realize, Pastor, like you said today, I didn't realize the stuff I'm bringing on myself in my life. I didn't realize it. And I'm so glad I've been saved. Nobody ever taught me that. That I've already been saved. I just need to surrender and receive this great gift. No one ever taught it to me that way. And maybe you're just pining away in your addiction and Jesus says, man, come on. The truth will set you free. I'm the truth. I'm the way. I'm the life. Come on. Partner with me. Let's start working this stuff out. And you'll be spared a lot of heartache in your life. And then, of course, like Paul will emphasize, we all better get ready. Because that curtain's going to fall, guys. It's going to fall. And so, we want to be ready and be saved. When that day comes. Now listen. If you'll just be practical with me for a few more moments. If you'll just be realistic. I want you to look at your life. Look at your body. Look at your family. Look at your, look at your personal character this morning. Look at the way you think about things. Look at your lack of self-control. Look at your lack of joy. Look at your lack of courage. Look at your fear. Look at the anxiety that you live your life with. The fear of being found out. The fear of what destruction you're bringing on your body and your life. And you don't even realize the extent of the damages in your life that you're kind of creating. What do you think all that is? 
The Bible calls it pollution, a spiritual infection. We can even use the S word, sin. It's sin. It's a pollution. It's an infection. You're not like Jesus. You and I are not. We don't have his courage. We don't have his grace. We don't have his graciousness. We don't go down. We tend to work up. We don't have the wholeness of life that he had. And anyone who's objective and looks at Jesus and says, I'm not like that. I, there's just no way my life could ever represent what Jesus represents in the incarnational kenosis passage of, of, of Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Well, you know what? When you admit that and you say it just like that, I'm not like that, but I sure would like to be. The Bible says salvation you've been saved you have been yes already you've been saved in the present moment and you're going to be saved you've aligned yourself with God's salvific plan you've aligned yourself with it and a new dynamic in the person of the Holy Spirit who teaches us truth he comes into our lives and we begin this process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus and the mindset of of Christ that's what Paul is asking the Philippians to do I can't be there he says I'm here I'm tied up at the moment no pun intended but I'm tied up at the moment I cannot escape these Roman guards I'm awaiting trial I don't know the result or outcome of this all I can do is write a letter and if I was there I know you'd be more apt to obey me but I'm not but will you pretend like I am and not just pretend like I am, but will you see Jesus as being present? And will you have the same energy of doing this as if Jesus would ask you to do it and have this mindset? Well, that's what he's asking us to do. And so I can't, as a pastor this morning, I can't possibly know the solution to every problem that's represented here today. I do carry with, the, with me the cares and concerns of the congregation and we will continue to pray for the cares and concerns of the congregation of your life and all the different age groups and the concerns that you have but can I take you to the place that Paul took his followers his the Christ followers that he was in charge of being a good stewardship of being a good pastor too can I take you to that one stop solution and say will you walk with me through Philippians 2 5 through 11 we don't always get it right. We don't always get it right. But we can certainly aspire to work out what God has worked in for his honor and glory. Natalie Grant is someone I've talked about here before. And she wrote a song that says, Burn Bright. It's a letter. Uh, she wrote a letter to her nephew struggling with addiction in Seattle. He had been saved he could potentially be saved in the future, but he wasn't working out his salvation very well, and so he's addicted. And what happened was uh, Natalie Grant's sister called and said, hey, my son, he, she humbled herself before her sister. You know, sometimes it's, it's not hard to admit our children have problems. It's hard to admit that. We got this vision, and it's almost like an idol thing where if our kids aren't doing great, then... You know, I can't really say anything to anybody because, man, you know, this, is, this breaks the image I'm trying to create. Well, forget image. Forget image. She's like, I don't care what people think in my family. I'm broken. My son is addicted and I want him free. Pray for him. Pray for him. And I want you to pray for him. And, and Natalie started praying for him. And, and of course... Uh, she tells the story how he was a great athlete in high school and he, had a, he sustained a major injury and he ended his dream of playing sports collegiately and he started all, it all started with painkillers and then someone gave him a drug and he was off to never, never land. And there was no going back. He had experienced something in that. You know, it sidestepped the reality and rather than lean into his... Uh, working out salvation daily with fear and trembling, with a sense of awe and reverence for the Lord's plan for our lives. Rather than do that, he just leaned into his drugs and it sapped the life right out of him. His eyes grew dark. His energy was gone. You've seen the type. 
they're just so talented and so blessed in so many ways, but they're a shell of a human being. They're there. They may be there eating fudge, sitting around the Christmas tree, but they're gone. They are not in the room. You've seen it. You've experienced it. You know what I'm talking about, and you know the hurt. And if you're a parent, God, be your strength and help as you work through the issues of watching this vibrant son of yours or daughter of yours grow dark and weary and dreary and they just kind of collapse because their life is being consumed from the inside out instead of Christ working in and out it's drugs working in and there's nothing coming out there's no life coming at all it's just a dark pit and and may God be our strength and may we be the type of church family where we can partner with and love and create an environment where new beginnings can happen that's what this is about Well, Natalie's nephew, he sunk deeper and deeper. And her sister labored under this. Her sister's husband just sunk under the load of it all. And finally, her nephew got strength enough to run and he disappeared. And she started thinking, you know, what would I like to say to my nephew if I had just a few minutes to say it? If he'd only give me two or three minutes of his time, what would I like to say? And she wrote him a letter, and that letter was cha- uh, changed into a song, or music, <coughs> music was set to it. And in the song, you're going to see here as we close, you're going to hear the cry of a heart for a nephew, the cry of a mother for a son, and the cry of a father for the broken. And I think Natalie Grant's letter to her nephew really applies to people struggling with other issues in life, especially this time of year. Issues like self-worth and depression and alcohol abuse and loneliness. And I think we all need to be, to be reminded of what we are made for sometimes. And today I want to let you know you're made to burn bright. You're bigger and better than your drugs. You're bigger and better than your porn. You're bigger and better than your relational conflict. You're a bigger and you're better. You've been saved. You're going to be saved. We want you to continue to work out your salvation now. We want you to work it out. We want you to burn bright. And later in this passage, go to the next slide, later in the passage, Paul says, uh, you'll shine among them like stars in the sky. Paul wanted them to create this inviting, compelling community for the addicted and those who are lost and those who aren't aware of their lostness to be able to come and be enfolded in this community and to burn bright. Roll it, guys. Burn bright. Let's respond right where you are.
together how we have extinguished or tried to lessen at least the brightness of the life that's come to the world and today we pray you would reignite the flame that lets the light shine through us the light of hope of good news and new beginnings thank you for the demeanor of Jesus. Thank you for modeling that. Thank you for helping us to see it again today. And I ask and pray now that all of us who need rescued, and that's every one of us, would find this complete and comprehensive salvation package applied to our lives. It's complete, it's entire, it's comprehensive. And it doesn't miss a one. The choice is ours. Home is bright. The family awaits. And so may we rise up. You who work in us to will and to do your good pleasure. As Philippians 2.13 tells us. That your energy right now. What we felt when we watched that. The little stab of emotion that these moms felt when they saw that little boy. The little stab of emotion these dads felt when they saw that boy throwing that football. That little, those little, uh, that little uh, uh, sense in the conscience. That was you. That was you. The ones that's been hollowed out by addictive patterns. And they felt... Oh, if I could just burn bright again. That was you. That was you. You're in the room. And so I ask and pray now that you would come again in fresh and new way. Bring your power and your strength. We would rise up and return to our Father's home and be embraced and renewed and set free yet again to shine and burn bright in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You've been a great group. Continue to read in Philippians 2, 12 through 18. We'll live there another Sunday at least. Also, would you stand with me? Please be reminded, uh, some of you, again, you know the Fry family personally. Some of you have questions. Hard to answer questions with any definitive sense of response in some of the questions anyway. And so Malin is going to uh, make his way over to room 306. And those of you who have questions regarding Denise, uh, please uh, just make your way in there when you're able. And he's happy to address those and talk to you about those. I wouldn't hold him too long. I know there's lots of things to do today. So if you could just hasten over there, again, through the doors, 306.